Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all of you who are joining us from um, across the world. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today, December 9th, 2022, marks the 74th anniversary of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide and the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and of the Prevention of this crime. So the theme of the day is the role of sports in atrocity prevention. And so today we shall highlight what it means for positive change to be born out of violence and hate. We shall hear from communities who have come together to promote inclusion and rights in the face of hate, including through the power of sports. Today we are also launching a very important initiative, a plan of action to counter hate speech through engagement with sport, the game plan, working with sports platforms and partnerships. I therefore welcome uh, the chef de cabinet, His Excellency El Courtney um, Ratley, who is representing United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I welcome the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Chaba Koroshi, and I welcome you, or Excellencies, Ambassadors. I also welcome representatives from the UN Sports Working Group, the Eradicate Hate Global Summit, and I also welcome those of you who've joined online and UN colleagues especially the resident coordinators worldwide who are holding events to mark this day. So I will now give the floor to the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency, Abbasinda Chaba Koroshi, to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Yosji. Excellencies, dear colleagues, friends, this day, was born out of the General Assembly's desire to ensure that never again would a person face the horror of genocide. And out of the GA's desire to honor those who continue to suffer because, unfortunately, the never again has become again and again. Today we also pay tribute to the people who helped to create in 1948, the Genocide Convention, adopted in the aftermath of Holocaust and the Second World War. It was the first human rights treaty adopted by the General Assembly. Governments have the prime responsibility to prevent genocide, but advocating for the world's most vulnerable is our collective responsibility. As it was announced uh, by the USG, today's event is dedicated to the role of sports in promoting peace and inclusion. Sports have changed a lot since the time of the Asian Greens. The events have lost their religious dimensions of comparing the human achievements to select the best performance and offer it to God, but still, preserved that sport is about coming together to work towards the same goal and compare the achievements in a peaceful and noble manner in accordance with agreed rules. In sports, everyone speaks the same language across boundaries, cultures and religions. Sports can develop a sense of understanding and awareness of diversity. It can combat stereotypes and hate speech. Athletes are among the most influential people in the world, giving a voice to the vulnerable people who don't have one. Athletes have been symbols of transformation and inclusions for decades. My message to the captains and athletes, you are role models for today's youth. Young people who are most exposed to extremism and radicalism. Your positive example teaches them rules, discipline and teamwork. You can educate them as nobody else can. Sports were born out of respect, devotion and human virtue. Let us not forget about it. 
we still need to do more to integrate a common approach to use sports to fight hate online and offline. I count on your commitment to advancing that important cause. Before concluding, I want to acknowledge today's keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Laura Ellsworth, for her work on the Eradicate Hate Global Summit, as well as our moderator, Ms. Uh, Misha Rosenthal, uh, for her inspiring efforts in this field. They both stand for the message of Nelson Mandela. No one is born hating another person. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. I thank you. I thank the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency, Ambassador Chaba Koroshi for his opening remarks. I will now give the floor for the opening remarks of Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, delivered by the Chef de Cabinet, His Excellency L. Courtney Ratley. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, the Secretary General very much regrets that he is unable to join with you this morning. I will deliver these remarks on his behalf. Today we remember and pay tribute to the victims and survivors of the genocides across the world. It is a day to re-examine our collective failure to prevent this crime in the past and redouble prevention efforts for the present and for the future. 74 years after the adoption of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the threat of genocide remains present. Discrimination and hate speech, early warning signs of genocide, are on the rise everywhere. We must do more to promote strong political leadership and resolute action against these dangerous trends. We must do more to live up to our commitment to liberate humanity, from the scourge of genocide. I therefore thank you for coming together in this deeply meaningful way and on such a timely initiative. The plan of action to combat hate speech through engagement with sports, known as Game Plan, is the product of two years of consultations led by my special advisor on the prevention of genocide and the UN Summit Countering Hate Sport Working Group, which began at the Eradicate Hate Summit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The working group is composed of representatives of various sport leagues in the United States and beyond. The game plan was born out of intense pain. Pittsburgh witnessed the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in United States history, when a gunman who had posted anti-Semitic and anti-refugee hate speech online killed 11 people, wounding more, including police officers, at the Tree of Life Synagogue. In Buffalo, New York, a gunman who had previously posted racist hate speech online killed 10 people and wounded three in a predominantly black neighborhood of Buffalo, New York. Hate speech is one of the most common warning signs of atrocity crimes, that is genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Again and again, I have been struck by the power of sport to bridge divides. I believe the game plan will support the beginning of an important conversation on addressing and countering hate speech, and ultimately foster prevention and violence and atrocity crimes such as genocide. Online and offline hate speech plays an important role in convincing people that violence is logical, justifiable, even necessary. The voice, authority, example, and conviction of the UN Summit Countering Hate Sport Working Group has led to the development of the initiative that we launched today, the plan of action to combat hate speech through engagement with sports. The game plan sets out a broad range of ways to address and counter incitement to violence responding to warning signs, 
to take early action to prevent these crimes. I urge the widest possible dissemination and implementation of the game plan. It can help save lives, reduce suffering, and realize our shared vision of peaceful, inclusive, and just societies in which diversity is valued and the rights of all individuals are protected. I recently visited Tuol Sleng Genocide Museum in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, where I had the privilege of meeting survivors of atrocity crimes. I call on every member state to take concrete steps to protect communities at risk, including minorities, and address discrimination and persecution. States have primary obligation, the primary obligation for preventing genocide, but sports, religious and community leaders, civil society, the private sector, and the media, including social media platforms, play an essential role. On this International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide, I urge all stakeholders to use all means at their disposal to prevent and end this crime. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you would bear with me, I'd like to deliver a few remarks on my own behalf. President of the General Assembly, UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now that I have read the message of the Secretary General, let me just say a few words in my capacity as United Nations Chef de Cabinet. The International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and the Prevention of this Crime must not only be a day of reflection, but also one for renewed commitment to act. Despite the lessons learned from the horrors of the Holocaust, as well as from Rwanda, Srebrenica, and Cambodia, we continue to face the challenge of preventing this heinous crime daily. Too many people continue to be discriminated against based on their identity. All the United Nations, at the United Nations, we believe that preventing genocide requires constant vigilance and commitment to act by all, including governments, international and regional organizations, as well as civil society, the media, and other important stakeholders. Prevention of genocide is an all of society endeavor. For this reason, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely pleased that today's event on the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and the Prevention of this Crime focuses on the contribution of the sport community in preventing genocide and other atrocity crimes. I firmly believe in the role of sport as a global unifying factor and one that speaks to all groups in societies, including women, youth, and the most vulnerable. Sport allows people to come together despite their differences for meaningful competition. Hence, I have no doubt that the game plan that we are launching here today will contribute to fostering inclusion and promote human dignity, including preventing intergroup tensions from escalating, countering and addressing hate speech and incitement to violence, and supporting the building of inclusive societies. Distinguished guests, by engaging with the sport community, we are one step closer to a world free from genocide and other atrocities. Today's commemoration provides an opportunity for us all, the international community, to renew our commitment to the prevention of genocide. Let's take up this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, United Nations Chef de Cabinet, Ambassador Courtney Latry, um, for the opening remarks of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, and for your own opening remarks. And um, President of the General Assembly, Chef de Cabinet, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today is a day of commemoration to remember and to honor the victims and survivors of the crime of genocide around the world. It is also a day for action. By taking concrete steps towards prevention, we can live up to the promise of this day and of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, adopted 74 years ago. My mandate is to monitor and raise alarm to the United Nations Secretary General, to the Security Council, to member states, and to other relevant actors on the risk factors of genocide and related atrocity crimes. 
I also raise awareness on the causes and dynamics of atrocity crimes and support member states and other relevant actors to promote prevention of these crimes. As the United Nations focal point on hate speech, my office coordinates the implementation of the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech launched by the Secretary General Antonio Guterres in 2019. History has taught us the dangers of hate speech and its impact if left unchallenged. Hate speech can be both an indicator of risk and a trigger of the atrocity crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. We saw this in the lead up to the Holocaust, the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, and the genocide in Srebrenica, where the narratives of the other were used to dehumanize and vilify, contributing to exclusion, stigmatization, discrimination, isolation, hate crimes, and in the most serious instances, atrocity crimes, including genocide. The 1948 convention codified the crime of genocide for the first time. Its preamble recognizes that at all periods of history, genocide has inflicted great losses on humanity, and that international cooperation is required to liberate humankind from such an odious scourge. According to the convention, genocide is a crime that can take place both in time of war as well as a time of peace. The international community and the United Nations has in the past been instrumental in setting the judicial mechanisms necessary to determine genocide as a crime. This includes the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. And I acknowledge the presence of uh, my colleagues and friends, Judge Gatti Santana, the president of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, and Serge Bramatz, the chief prosecutor of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. So the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide has been ratified by 153 United Nations member states, demonstrating its significance. The most recent ratification was in July this year by the Republic of uh, Zambia. So leading up to the 75th commemoration of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which will be next year on 9th December 2024, my office will launch an initiative to support state parties to the Genocide Convention to strengthen the implementation of the convention at national level and encourage states that have yet to do so to ratify the Genocide Convention. Among those who have ratified include some who have adopted national legislation to punish the crime of genocide at national level or further enhance its application by the recognition of universal jurisdiction for this crime. Some have ratified the convention but not taken steps to domesticate it in national legislation, limiting its effectiveness. The domestication of the convention provides an opportunity to support mechanisms for prevention at the national level. The initiative will also aim to create a system of peer exchange between state parties to enhance knowledge sharing and good practices in this regard. Genocide is a process throughout which there are warning signs. Ratification and the establishment of national legal and policy tools as well as structures that can identify and address these early warning signs is a crucial step of prevention. So we do know that identity-based conflicts and hate crime cannot always be solved by national governments and traditional diplomacy. Translating the concept of genocide prevention and countering and addressing of hate speech as an international norm into a practical reality implemented at the community level remains one of my top priorities. Engaging communities as partners in decision making and policy formulation processes is crucial to the prevention and de-escalation of atrocity crimes. On October 27, 2018, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, witnessed the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in United States history. And the Pittsburgh community leaders, through the Eradicate Hate Global Summit, invited Secretary General Antonio Guterres for a commemoration in October 2021. The Secretary General asked me to represent him as the keynote speaker. And the, I was impressed with the Pittsburgh community's commitment that they would be remembered more for their global leadership against hate and not just the terrible act of hate that had happened in their midst. I went back to Pittsburgh in September 2022 for the second Eradicate Hate Global Summit, and I met speakers who spoke of shootings such as had happened in Buffalo, motivated by hate, where a gunman killed 10 people and wounded three in a racist attack 
at a grocery store in a predominantly black neighborhood. So in recognition of the prevalence of hate crimes globally, the Eradicate Hate Global Summit and my office created the UN Summit Sport Working Group composed of representatives of various sport leagues and partners um, who include the Pittsburgh Steelers, Major League Baseball, Boston Red Sox, Fenway Sports Group, Buffalo Bills, Major League Soccer, National Football League, Buffalo Sabres, United States Women's National Soccer Team, the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the National Association for Stock Racing, NASCA, Major League Soccer, MLS, National Basketball Association, NBA, Women National Basketball Association, WNBA, Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC, the National Hockey League, NHL, and Pegula Sports and Entertainment, the Anti-Defamation League Sports Leadership Council, and CNX Sports. And outside of the US, we also have the Liverpool Football Club. And I co-chair this UN Summit group with Michelle Rosendahl, who will be speaking shortly, and, uh, with, um, and, and with Laura Ellsworth, who is co-chair of the Eradicated Global Summit, and who will also be speaking shortly. So the UN Summit Sport Working Group put together the plan of action for countering hate speech through engagement with sports, the game plan, based on the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech, and fully aligned with international human rights law, in particular the right to freedom of expression and opinion. Like the President of the General Assembly, I turn to Nelson Mandela in his infinite wisdom, who left us with these words. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. We look forward to continuing the wonderful collaboration as the United Nations that we have begun here with the Eradicate Hate Summit and the UN Summit Sport Working Group through the game plan and working with you, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, United Nations resident coordinators around the world who have joined us online, to take this important plan of action to every part of the world and engage as many sports partners as possible in our collective fight against hate speech and atrocity crimes. And in that way, once again, give voice to the never again that resonated in this very United Nations in 1948, when the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide became the first ever human rights treaty adopted by the United Nations. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will now turn to the personal stories, and I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, Ms. Michelle Rosenthal. Ms. Michelle Rosenthal is a member of the Summit Executive Committee and a co-chair, and she's former head of community affairs for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Michelle Rosenthal lost two brothers, David and Cecil Rosenthal, in the Pittsburgh Tree of Life attack. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Special Advisor, uh, President of the General Assembly, and Chef de Cabinet. I'm humbled to be in front of a group as distinguished as the United Nations. I asked myself how I ended up here with people who change the world every day on such a large scale. I don't have an advanced education or background in understanding hate. I am not experienced in public speaking and in fact mostly help others to be in the public light. I don't have many of the things all of you may have. And perhaps this, what I don't have, is precisely why I've been asked to stand before you today. I don't have my brothers, Cecil and David, anymore because of what occurred on October 27, 2018, at the Tree of Life Synagogue. But ironically, even though we don't have them here any longer, and they were not known publicly in their lives, I wholeheartedly believe they still offer us something in the way they lived. I'm the proud daughter of Ellie and Joy Rosenthal. I was raised in the tight-knit Jewish community of Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, along with my sister and brothers. We frequently spent Saturdays in the synagogue with my grandma. Unlike me and my sister, my brothers continued going to services every single Sabbath 
long after my grandma had passed. They were some of the most dedicated congregants. They often were literally first through the door to greet people. I know my neighbors by name, just as their grandparents and my grandparents knew each other. We were one of many neighborhoods of Pittsburgh that has continued its strong identity based on the immigrant groups who settled there. So on Saturday, October 27, 2018, our Sabbath, when my husband and I were planning to run our weekly errands, everything felt normal. We lived two blocks from the Tree of Life Synagogue. On that quiet morning, I came downstairs and he remarked that something must be wrong because of all of the sirens he was hearing. My curiosity peaked a bit, but I knew we were safe because we lived in the peaceful neighborhood of Squirrel Hill. We got in the car and my husband's phone notified him of a text. My family's life would forever change at that moment. The text read, active shooter at Tree of Life Synagogue. I screamed, the boys are there. At the scene, we heard over and over again that the shooter was screaming, all Jews must die. The boys, my brothers, Cecil and David Rosenthal, both older than me with my sister Diane in between them. Both had fragile X, a genetic condition that causes intellectual disability, behavioral and learning challenges. But that condition did not define them. I knew they were different. My whole family knew. But my amazing parents, in their wisdom and love, ensured that the boys were part of our family and they would be treated equally. What I failed to realize is that they were not equal, but far better than most in our world. They had a strong sense of identity and connection to their faith community. They flawlessly exhibited characteristics that most never achieve in a lifetime. Inquisitive, trusting, sensitive, thankful, kind, loving, and compassionate. They were raised at home and then continued living in a group home in our neighborhood within Pittsburgh, the city of champions. The nickname given to Pittsburgh for our numerous championship sports teams. Not only have we been the city of champions, where our sports teams have long been the connective tissue of the city, but we are also a city of bridges that span over our three large rivers. Those rivers often divide these historic ethnic neighborhoods and are likely the reason that Squirrel Hill has remained for many generations as the center of Jewish life. But after the shooting, I witnessed something very special and uplifting occur. I saw a city culturally divided by rivers and bridges come together as one. In one heart pounding moment, neighbors crossed all of their preconceived divides to help comfort and serve one another. Although I was overwhelmed by the chaos, heartache and tragedy of the day, I found an unexpected source of strength in the weeks to come. The solidarity in which my city stood against such terrible hate as well as their unconditional love and care for those of us left grieving such a terrible loss. We witnessed the Pittsburgh sports teams come together and take the lead in the fight against hate. My career began in politics and government and then transitioned to sports when I worked for the Pittsburgh Steelers in community relations. In 2015, I started my own consulting business, which has allowed me to continue to work with athletes in sports. My community relations experience has taught me how impactful the platform of sports can be to reach, connect, and affect positive change. After the shooting, my journey has led me to become a part of the Eradicate Hate Global Summit. Through the summit, I have had the opportunity to meet so many amazing people who all share a common bond. One of those individuals was the United Nations Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Alison Duritu. Following the summit last year, the Special Advisor reached out to Lara and me to form the Sports Working Group, which you will hear more about from Lara Ellsworth, who has done an extraordinary job establishing this conference. 
I know that words matter, especially when people have a large audience. I have had the opportunity to meet many political leaders on the local and national level in my career. I have gotten to know personally the lives of some of the most famous athletes in my generation and had advised and guided them in their community relations activities. But the way my brothers lived and the legacy they left behind is a lesson that we all have more growth to do in the simple ways of curiosity, compassion, and seeing other people with no judgment. And regrettably, I was not aware of how they impacted our city and the people that make it special until after their deaths. Cecil and David, good men who lived good lives. Cecil and David did not know hate until the last minutes of their lives. They exhibited all of the qualities and actions we want the world to show towards each other. And we have an opportunity to carry that forward on a level they would have never imagined. I hope that you will join us to follow their example. Thank you, Michelle Rosenthal, as always. And um, I would now like to invite Mr. Raymond Whitfield, who is a survivor and who comes from Buffalo, who lost his mother in Buffalo, where a hate crime that was committed by a gunman who killed 10 people and wounded three in a racist attack at a grocery store in a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, happened. So please, Mr. Whitfield. Good morning. Please allow me to start by asking for your patience should I stumble along the way. You see, our scars are still fresh, and we are still finding our way. That said, on behalf of my family and all the victims of Buffalo, New York 514 heinous racially motivated massacre, of 10 innocent souls that included my beloved mother, Miss Ruth E. Whitfield. I thank you for this opportunity, and I'd like to especially thank the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Alice Ndutu, along with this esteemed institution and everyone involved with this historic initiative for inviting us to add our voices of resilience to denounce hate speech wherever it is and in all of its forms. For me, today is a beautiful, tragic day. It's beautiful because in this wondrous space of endless possibilities, I get to share this monumental moment with you. Yet, I'm ever mindful that I got here by losing the most precious thing in the world to me in the worst possible way in the hands of a misguided, isolated individual turned white supremacist who decided my loved one, and by extension me and everyone who remotely looks like me, does not belong here. And worse, we don't even deserve the right to exist. In the damnable words of that assailant, his intent was to kill as many black people as he could. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this despicable act was his preamble to genocide. But in this moment, it was in that moment to experience the sympathetic outpouring of support from the greater Buffalo region to the global community and with that, to have the hometown heroes of our sports teams reach out and embrace us. And embrace us to say that yes, you do belong here. Yes, you do belong on our team. You have a contribution to make, you see, because there's still time left on the clock. We can still get a win. In that spirit, my family and I are determined to discover innovative ways to pull our communities up, not by the proverbial bootstraps,
but by the heartstrings of the countless loved ones who have fallen before us, heartstrings that inexorably tie us to this cause. But we know we need you. We need all of you. These United Nations, the athletes, sports teams, and leagues, your voice matters, perhaps more than you can know, because it uniquely resonates not only with the brokenhearted, grieving families, but it also connects with the isolated, misguided individual who is left confronting a choice, and that choice is to become a lone wolf loser or to join the winning team. And we will win. Together, we will win. By choosing love, peace, and equity for all. On behalf of the victims of hate speech and violence worldwide, from the bottom of our hearts, for all that you do in commensurating your efforts here today in this fight, we thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you very much, Ms. Michelle Rosenthal, um, for sharing those stories of pain we do know how difficult it is to speak about these kind of issues. And uh, we thank you for, for grounding us in um, what we are trying to do uh, moving forward, which is to carry the world with us um, as we work on mm -hmm. countering and addressing hate. So I would now, in the interest of time, we are moving very fast. And I would like to invite uh, Laura Rose. Uh, so, Laura Ellsworth to now take over and um, introduce the panel that will continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Special Advisor, Excellencies, esteemed guests, it is an honor for all of us to be here with you today. My name is Laura Ellsworth and I am the co-chair of the Eradicate Hate Global Summit. I'm also a partner in a law firm called Jones Day, where I run community initiatives in 40 offices on five continents around the world. And I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I have been an admirer and friend of Michelle Rosenthal for 10 years, and more recently of Raymond Whitfield and his family. The attack that happened in Pittsburgh that killed Michelle's two brothers and nine others was the worst of humanity on display for the world. But it was in the days and months after that event that brings us here today. And as was said, we saw people of every faith and race and gender and ethnicity and nationality come out in support of the victims and to say no to hate. And not just in Pittsburgh, around the world. But in the weeks after the vigils ended, those voices quieted. And only months later, half a world away in Christchurch, New Zealand, we watched another community endure the same grief and pain and suffering as we had when 51 Muslims were killed at prayer. And again, we watched the world rise up and say no to hate. And again, we watched those voices fade away. We understood that we in Pittsburgh shared a terrible kinship with communities around the world, with Christchurch, with Buffalo, with El Paso, with Poway, on and on and on, where people who had done nothing were killed for who they were. 
And we know that hate has no nationality. It is a universal poison and no one is immune because everyone is the other to someone. And so we in Pittsburgh said to ourselves, what can we do to mobilize those voices of good, not after the tragedy, but before? How can we build a culture of those voices that we know are there, that we know counter hate? How can we bring them to the fore? And so together with my summit co-chair, Mark Nordenberg, the Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Pittsburgh, we amassed a group of community leaders and philanthropists in Pittsburgh, and we founded the Eradicate Hate Summit that you've heard a great deal about. The summit brings the global experts in the world in anti-hate, and people who know maybe even more than they do, the survivors of hate. We bring them together in person, across disciplines, across borders, across cultures, across political and ideological divides to come together and work together to achieve targeted solutions that can help reduce the incident of hate. How do we do it? The top people in the world, together in person in Pittsburgh, where we form working groups with a specific deliverable to achieve and a year to do it, and they'll be on their feet one year later at the next annual summit explaining to the world how far they got. The summit is built to drive results. The working group that you're going to meet here today is one of those working groups from the summit. We involve people from every sphere of work, from technology, from law, from sports, medicine, academia, civil society, government, law enforcement. Everyone in the world who has a stake in fighting hate. And it is everyone in the world. This isn't somebody else's problem, this is our problem. Every single one of us owns a piece of the solution to this problem. Today, the working group includes representatives of the United Nations and every major sports league in the United States, and then some. You'll be hearing from some of them in a moment but many more of them are here today. And if I could ask for your indulgence, I would like to have the members of the sport working group stand to be recognized. Please stand. Thank you. Over the last two years, this group has been working to develop what we call the game plan, which provides a menu of resources and practices that fans and teams and leagues and corporate partners can deploy in their own operations and in the communities in which they live and work, not after the tragedies, but to create an ongoing and incessant global culture that visibly and actively says no to hate in all of its forms, wherever it may be found. The quote from Nelson Mandela was so profound to us and the most important part of it for this gathering is when he said it speaks to youth in a language that they can understand. As Raymond just told you and as Michelle and I and others involved in the summit have come to learn, almost without exception, the most prolific killers in hate crimes are young men, lost young men who have been seduced by the very active voices of hate in this world. We can and must put other voices in front of them with the same urgency and incessant nature as those who would proffer hate. That is what sports has the power to do. Now our working group started with what we knew best, the sports teams of the United States, but we know that our game plan will be made immeasurably better by the input from other countries, other cultures, other sports, other teams. And that's what brings us here today. We can't do that alone. We need your help. We need every person in this room to teach us 
who your sports teams are, connect us, introduce us, bring their voices to our game plan. Help us grow, help us make it better, help us take it around the world over the next two years so that when we stand up in front of the summit in two years, we can say that every country on the face of this earth has said to its sports teams, be a part of this solution, to stand up and visibly say no to hate in all of its forms. And for the next lost young man who is sitting there today in his basement or his attic looking for guidance, looking for purpose and truth, he will hear our voices and not the voices of hate. We are all truly humbled to be here today. We don't work for governments, we're not diplomats. We are ordinary citizens who have refused to be cowed by hate. And you will hear from people today who have resolved to do everything in their power to bring their organizations to join us in this mission. We're here today to ask all of you to join us in this mission as well. I close these remarks with the words of another Pittsburgher, Dr. Jonas Salk, who developed the cure for polio, and I suspect is an inspiration to many people in this room today. Dr. Salk said, hope lies in dreams, in imagination, and in the courage of those who dare to make dreams a reality. We are here today in this room to ask all of you to help us make our dream a reality. And with that, I want to introduce you to the first member of our sport working group, who was actually the first member of our sport working group and has been instrumental in its growth from the beginning. I turn over the floor to Anna Isaacson of the National Football League. Anna. Thank you, Laura. It's an honor to be here with you today. The National Football League, the NFL, has long held the belief that there are really two core pillars to our existence, and that is football and community. We are so fortunate to enjoy the support of millions of fans around the country and globally and in return, it is our responsibility, our obligation, to give back to these communities that continue to sustain us year after year. We embrace this responsibility to use our platform to address some of the world's most pressing challenges, cancer, gender-based violence, social justice, and more. It is our core value of respect that drives much of this work, particularly that of Inspire Change, our social justice initiative that works to end racism and stop hate in all of its forms. And it is the motivation behind our active support for this working group and this plan of action to counter hate speech in sports. Our fans include every demographic in the nation. The majority of our NFL players are black men. This has proven to be a powerful combination where unity emerges and we strive to choose love over anything else. Sports brings people together, and that unity is palpable when you're lucky enough to find yourself in a rocking stadium with 60,000 plus fans. Of course, sport also has its challenges, and we have our challenges at the NFL. We often mirror society, and we have all witnessed far too much hatred and vitriol but what sports has is passion and energy. And every one of us here believe the passion and energy to also move people and make an impact. It's really an honor to speak before you today, to join my colleagues, my friends, to drive home the power that sport has to make meaningful change in our societies. As the head of social responsibility for the NFL, I've had the pleasure to witness this force for good for nearly two decades. And there is nothing, nothing more motivating than this incredible phenomenon. We will do a lot of good together as each of us go back and implement the key facets of this plan in our own ways. Thank you for having me. 
And I'm now pleased to introduce my colleague, Rishi Jain, Senior Manager, Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion of the Liverpool Football Club. Thank you, Anna. I would like to start by echoing the sentiments of colleagues. Thank you to Laura, Michelle, and Special Advisor Enzarito for the leadership, commitment, and direction in making today and the efforts of the Sports Working Group possible. Thank you to the General Assembly for generally hosting us and providing myself and colleagues with this platform to share our thoughts with you today. Liverpool Football Club is the world's most followed football club. Our 130-year history sees the club as the most successful English football team on the pitch. Success is very much part of our history. Success off the pitch is also pivotal to what we do, and it's why we are extremely appreciative of the warm welcome of colleagues who recognise the role that we have played in striving for equality. At Liverpool FC, we are committed to equality, diversity and inclusion and eradicating hate. It's something that's entrenched within our values. Our employees, players, supporters, communities, stakeholders, they expect us to lead in this area. They expect us to take on issues that are relevant to the sport and beyond. Our work in this area is encompassed by the Red Together programme, and this is how we talk about our commitment to eradicating hate and discrimination and promoting inclusion. We take this responsibility very seriously and are privileged to have such well-respected voices in this space who can talk to this authentically and with purpose. We've seen first-team manager Jurgen Klopp speak openly and candidly about his allyship to the LGBT plus community. Club captain Jordan Henderson, men's players Trent Alexander-Arnold and Virgil van Dijk, and many others talk authentically to topics around racial equity, gender equality, and disability inclusion. It's no coincidence that Liverpool FC was the first UK sports team to take the knee. We see Liverpool FC's role in this as leaders with a platform to use our voice to prevent atrocities through education and raising awareness, ensuring consequences to action at a lower level to hope, hopefully preventing them occur at their most tragic. In UK football, the main mechanism of hate speech is in social media. And despite our success and popularity, we are not immune to that. We see this hate far too often. For example, a typical non-match day social media post will receive around 500 comments. A, holiday market, uh, a post marking a Jewish holiday will receive 40,000, with over 50% of them being hate speech. Our role in the sports working group is relatively new and we are tasked with bringing the game plan across to the UK and beyond. We recognise and embrace, for it to be a truly global plan and set of commitments, it must translate to all sports, communities and ways of life. Using football as a mechanism to do this, the biggest game in the world, under the banner of Liverpool Football Club, the biggest football club in the world, is an important task. To raise awareness, educate, and promote the eradication of hate is something that we are wholeheartedly committed to. We wish to leverage our resources, brand, and reach to support this coalition to be a truly global plan of action. Thank you for your time. I will now pass you to my colleague, Rebecca Solwasser from the Boston Red Sox. I'm sorry, just before you do, um, sorry to interrupt, but... Um at some point, the chef de cabinet and the president of the General Assembly will be stepping out. So I thought it important to say this. And um, also to recognize um, that um, we have several ambassadors in the room, um, including those who will be speaking on behalf of the regional groups, uh, Ambassador um, Excellency Gatete from Rwanda, uh, Ambassador um, His Excellency Paul Lele Lutero from the Samoa, Excellency Danilov Frushkoshki from um, North Macedonia, Excellency um, B B Moncada, Ambassador from the uh, Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and we also have the Ambassador Permanent Mission of Ireland to the United Nations, Excellency Fergal Maithen, and several other ambassadors in the room. Uh, we have Excellencies from Guyana, we have from Uruguay, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Cyprus, we, sorry, we can't name all of them, but uh, just wanted to acknowledge 
that. And so thank you, and uh, you can continue. Good everybody. Thank you, Rishi, for the introduction. I'd like to begin with gratitude. Uh, thank you to Laura, Michelle, and the special advisor for being the heart of this work and hurting all of us and our respective agencies and entities the last few months. Without your direction, inspiration, and organization, none of this would be possible. Thank you also to Secretary General Guterres for spearheading this effort and to the President of the General Assembly for having us today and permitting us to share our vision and mission with, with you all. It is clear that you are committed and inspired as we are by this critical work. And thank you to my colleagues and peers for committing yourselves and your agencies to improving our collective communities. As you may know, Fenway Sports Group has a broad portfolio that includes the Boston Red Sox, Liverpool Football Club, the Pittsburgh Penguins, a stake in NASCAR's RFK Racing, and a sports marketing agency, to name a few. We joined this working group because its mission perfectly aligns with the core principles and priorities of our ownership group at FSG. In addition to winning championships, which is core to everything we do, one of the fundamental commitments we've made to our constituents is to be an inclusive organization where everyone feels welcome. But this is simply not possible if your venues are spaces where people don't feel welcome, or where people feel comfortable using racial slurs, or where homophobia is tolerated. So we've worked hard over the past 20 years to make our internal organizations and our venues at Fenway Park and our partner venues communities of inclusion. Now that's not to say we haven't had our fair share of incidents. In fact, we've seen an uptick in reported hate incidents at Fenway Park over the last few years specifically. While we think this increase is due to both the pandemic's negative influence on fan behavior and the current contentious global environment, we're hopeful that the rise is mostly attributed to our efforts to empower and inspire our fans to call out and condemn hatred in any shape or form. As a former professional athlete myself, I can tell you how personally meaningful and important this work is. I've seen and lived firsthand the power of sport. At its best, it can unify, equalize, and create joy and inspiration. But at its worst, sports can fuel division, hate, exclusion, and even violence. I choose to have hope that we can make the most out of our world's common denominator, which is sport. I choose optimism that together we can unite our people, voices, brands, and resources to eliminate and end hate. By aligning our agencies, we can take a hard stand against those that choose to spread vitriol and bigotry. By leveraging the celebrity of our athletes and players, we can influence our fans, fans to choose love and kindness and to see that we all have more in common than we do differences. So I'd like to close where I began, with his which is gratitude. Despite much of this work's purpose, beginning with loss and grief, I'm grateful for the commitment and passion of so many who continue to fuel our efforts. I look forward to continued collaboration and pledge on behalf of John Henry, Tom Werner, Mike Gordon, and our entire FSG ownership group that we are dedicated to this mission and eager to see the impact of our contributions. Thank you, and I'd like to pass it to my colleague, Orrin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President General Assembly. Thank you, Special Advisor. Laura Ellsworth, Michelle Rosenthal, Raymond Whitfield, uh, thank you for the inspiration. Uh, my name is Oren Siegel. I'm the Vice President of the ADL Center on Extremism. My job uh, at ADL, whose mission is to not only stop the defamation of the Jewish people, but to secure justice and fair treatment for all, my job is to lead ADL's effort to identify, analyze, and respond to extremism and hate, to expose those who seek to divide us, to incite violence, and to protect communities and hold the bad actors accountable. But I also view my role, uh, as much as I can, as finding hope in the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, and that hope is rooted in the knowledge that even in moments 
of political and social strife, when extremism and hate threaten our communities, our democracies, our ability to communicate and share experiences, that there are indeed alternatives to all that. There are off-ramps. There are strategies that can make a meaningful impact in the fight against hate. And sports have that undeniable and unique power to bring people together. You've heard this. You will hear it over and over from my colleagues. A match or a game provides spectators with a much needed sense of community. Fans are focused on what unites them, even for just a moment, rather than their differences. And we have an opportunity here to harness this unifying energy to address and counter hate while also advocating for respect and inclusion. Players, teams, leagues, governing bodies have an incredible opportunity to join in this effort to cultivate the broadest possible participation in this critical global initiative. We fundamentally believe the value of our sports are not only greater than our perceived divisions, but can be an actual catalyst in the fight against hate or the fight for good. And as a leading anti-hate organization, ADL is committed to seeking out innovations and partnerships in this fight. That's why I'm here today. That and Michelle and Raymond. This is also why in 2017, we launched at ADL the Sports Leadership Council to bring together leaders from across the industry, commissioners, team owners, athletes, academics, others, with the mission to use the unifying power of sports to promote and achieve positive social change. It's not just on the field, it's not just in the locker room, but also in broader communities around the country and around the world. We have learned a lot over the past five years. We have done a lot of listening and we have been inspired and we have recommitted ourselves to sharing the best practices that we have learned in which the sports community can proactively counter hate of all kinds. With ADL's expertise in combating anti-Semitism, extremism, and all forms of hate, we are excited not only to explain the landscape and the challenges of this, but also advise on the best ways for sports organizations to activate against hate in meaningful and impactful ways. Together, the United Nations Office on Genocide Prevention and the Eradicate Hate Summit Sports Working Group are creating new ways for sports teams leagues, fans, people who care to recognize and forcefully counter hate, to be that force for good, a reminder of what is possible when influencers and organizations and fans come together and use their collective voice to lead. There's a long history of sports, which is filled with moments uh, and leaders who have impacted social change. Uh, people who have inspired millions. Uh, we strive to be part of that legacy, that effort to marry the possibilities of sports to change the world with a commitment that we have to making the world a better place. We are excited, we are honored to join this effort to deepen our collective commitment and to be part of this inspiring team. And now it's my honor to pass the MIC to the indefatigable Christy Joseph.
22, tragedy struck our community when 10 people were killed and three were injured in a racially motivated shooting at a top supermarket in East Buffalo. This vile act has no place in our community and our organizations responded immediately to help those most affected by this heartbreaking event. Our owners, players, coaches, alumni, and members of our front office spent time volunteering in our community. Our teams visited the memorial site and local schools over the following months. And we honored our victims, survivors, and their families at home opening ceremonies. Our foundations assisted local charities and nonprofit organizations directly helping the victims and the community at large. Our fan bases raised over a million dollars through Choose Love t-shirts to donate to the Buffalo Together Community Response Fund and the Buffalo 514 Survivors Fund. But this is not the end of our focus in the fight against racism and hate speech in our community and world. Hate has no place in our community. Our players amplify that every time they step on the ice or field this season with wearing Choose Love, End Racism, and Stop Hate on their helmets. That's why this means so much to us to be a part of this working group and to help implement the game plan. Sport has the power to unify and inspire, and by implementing the working group's game plan, we hope to inspire our fans to eradicate hate in our community and instead choose love. <clears throat> we thank all of you for recognizing the importance of this initiative, and we look forward to applying the game plan throughout our organizations going forward. Stop hate, end racism, choose love. I will now pass it to my colleague, Mr. Pete Stewart, Managing Director of Social Responsibility for NASCAR. Thank you, Christy. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the privilege of leading social responsibility, community engagement, and partnerships for NASCAR. I'll start by thanking the United Nations for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm certainly grateful for the chance to come together as part of this very important collective of leagues and teams. The opportunity before us to leverage the power of sport to end hate is an incredible one. But it must be more than simply explored. It should be seized with an intense focus and a tremendous sense of urgency. As it's been said, sports are a place where people come together, all people, all communities. It is one of the great unifiers that exists across our global culture. We believe that should be true about NASCAR, the sport that I represent here today. You see, there's a lot to love about stock car racing and so much that makes us unique. The sights, the sounds, the speed of the cars. But what's also true is that it shouldn't matter your gender. It shouldn't matter your race, who you love, or how you worship. When those engines fire, all that should matter is how well you can drive a race car. For that reason, NASCAR should be a leading example when it comes to diversity, inclusion, tolerance, acceptance. But it hasn't always been that way. We are a sport now that is undergoing a transformation. When NASCAR made its voice heard in June of 2020, we acknowledged openly and honestly that our sport had not done enough to help bridge the divide that exists in our country. In doing so, we held ourselves accountable and recommitted the entire NASCAR industry to building a more welcoming and inclusive environment for everyone that loves racing. The first and most critical step in that process was banning the Confederate flag from all racetracks and facilities. A message to the world that our venues in sport would not be a haven for symbols of hate and oppression. It was a seminal moment in NASCAR's history that inspired more positive change, an expanded DE&I platform, revamped education and training resources, impactful community engagement, and a more resonant voice on social issues. Communities that did not think NASCAR was for them are now feeling differently about our sport and helping us build a culture that is safe and welcoming. That's why we're here today, because we believe NASCAR has a responsibility to help end hate speech 
and we believe in the unifying power of sport to have an impact on a global scale. I would like to thank Laura and Michelle for assembling this working group and the UN for believing in the role that sports can play and helping to shepherd this important work. We are eager and excited to help bring this collaboration to bear. Thank you once again for your time and I will now turn it back over to Laura. Thank you, Pete, and thank you all of the members of our sport working group. Um, I will turn the floor back over to the very special advisor, Alison Dorit. Thank you very much, Laura, um, the co-chair of the Eradicate Hate Global Summit, and uh, thank you to Anna Isaacson, the senior vice president, Social Responsibility National Football League. Thank you to Mr. Rishi Jane, senior manager, equality, diversity, and inclusion, Liverpool Football Club, Ms. Rebecca Splain Salwasa, who is Executive Director, Red Sox Foundation, Mr. Oren Segal, uh, Vice President, Centre on Extremism, Anti-Defamation League, Ms. Christy Joseph, Senior Vice President, People and Administration, People and Business Administration, Pegula Sports and Entertainment, and Mr. Peter Stuart, uh, Senior Director, Social Responsibility. Um, I would like to say that you know, whatever we are doing here, um, anything that we do as the Secretariat, we always rely on the support of the member states um, to lead us um, and to provide support in everything that we are doing. And I would like to appreciate that when we had the webinar uh, that prepared us for what we are doing today, that uh, from the U.S. mission to, uh, to the U.N., uh, Ms. Melanie Zimmerman gave a great speech and she grounded us uh, in terms of the belief uh, of the mission in everything that we are doing. And I would like to introduce Mr. Doug Bunch, who is the public delegate of the United States to the United Nations, to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Doug Bunch. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to be here uh, on behalf of the United States to commemorate this day um, instances of hate and rage close to home here in the United States, in Pittsburgh and in Buffalo, um, have deeply scarred the lives of people here on this very panel, whose courage we admire for being here with us today. Farther away, in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Ukraine, we've seen sobering reminders of what atrocity prevention means in 2022 lost lives, lost generations, lost livelihoods, demolished social infrastructure, including hospitals, destroyed social contracts, and the prospect of unimaginable, unimaginable grief turned to hate and rage. At the individual level, we see the generational and toxic impact that trauma has on survivors and their families. Without appropriate support in the short and long runs, this trauma frays social fabric and inclusion and risks a renewed cycle of violence. At the collective, national, and global level, armed violence and insecurity have a destructive impact on a country's development, affecting economic growth and often resulting in long-standing grievances among communities. Violence affects children's rights, health, development, and well-being, and their ability to thrive. There's a perfect storm of issues impacting children and youth right now. We should all be concerned about the significant development backsliding this portends and the escalating fragility risk overall in communities. Lack of access to justice means that conflicts remain unresolved and survivors cannot secure their own protection and redress. Institutions that do not function according to legitimate laws succumb to arbitrariness and abuse of power and become less capable of delivering public services to everyone. Exclusion and discrimination not only violate human rights, but also cause resentment, animosity, and give rise to violence. We have seen a confluence of crises here at home and around the world, which together, propelled by the injustices I've just cited, have colluded to turn, black, to turn back the clock of progress. 
The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, need urgent rescuing, as the Secretary General noted earlier this year, or we risk pushing millions into hunger and poverty, working against the very core of the SDGs of leaving no one behind. SDG 16, which is about peace, justice, and strong institutions, and focuses on reducing violence, death rates, abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and corruption, is the foundation on which the other SDGs are all built. The rule of law safeguards against some of the structural root causes of atrocities, fostering trust between the state and its people through the principle of equality before the law, regardless of whether you are a member of the cabinet or a mother or a member of a minority ethnic group. This is hard work, not to be done alone or in isolation. It is and should be inherently connected to other prevention efforts, conflict prevention, violence prevention, and the prevention of sexual and gender-based violence. Sport has historically been a key mechanism for bringing communities together across divides and can be an important vehicle for promoting positive messages that contribute to social inclusion and cohesion, strengthening understanding and respect to, for diversity and reducing stereotypes. I thank our panelists for speaking to concrete examples of the impact of sport on prevention. We must all work together member states, the UN system, civil society, and human rights defenders to truly make never again an, a reality on the global level, to choose love, as Mr. Woodfields described before. We will win, and sports are one vehicle and avenue to work towards this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dobanch. Um, again, as we keep emphasizing we would be nowhere without uh, the member states. We really need their support. And this plan of action, this game plan that has been launched today will require so much work to get out there. Now we have some supporting voices uh, for the event of people who joined from outside, quite a number of athletes, and we chose just a few. Um, so they joined online. So we had uh, Miss Beatrice Vio, the Paralympic fencing champion from Italy. And we had uh, Catherine Nyambura Dereba, who um, has been a wa marathon world champion and is the only four-time winner of the women winner of the Boston Marathon. And uh, then we have Mr. Habibul Bashar, who is ex-captain of Bangladesh cricket team. So I do not know whether they've joined online. Yes. So I'm giving the floor to Habibu, whom I see on the on the um, Habibu Bashar, whom I see on the screen um, for one minute. Habibu, please go ahead. You have one minute. I'm sorry, you are muted. Sorry, happy, but we can't hear you. It's unfortunate. Yeah, we can't hear you. So I'm told Catherine is also online, and if she is able to speak, then we can come back to Habibu. And if she's not, then we can just quickly move in the interest of time to the next session. Hello. Okay, there you are. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. That's Catherine. Yes, Catherine, we can hear you. Yeah, hi, how are you? Very um, well, thank you. <laughs> well, um, yes, I'm glad to get to meet with you. And sorry, I took a longer time uh, to get to join the meeting, but uh, I thank God finally I can be able to hear you uh, audibly. And uh, I really thank God for that. Uh, all I can say is that uh, sports uh, is and uh, is 
and should always be an instrument for promotion and transmission of values such as fair play, mutual respect, respect and tolerance in addition to being an activity to promote health. The world of sports reflects in inequality, clouds of discrimination existing in our society in general. Gender inequality, for, for, for instance, is even more conspicuous in environment. Women's participation, media disability, um, uh, uh, and hello. You, we can hear you, but you are very faint. Yes. Yeah, but we I'm got the key message that uh, you've passed across. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so, yes, so, I can and can I can later email the what I'm saying. Yes. But uh, well, if, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, and thank you for taking okay, the time to be with us. And, and uh, because you are not very mm -hmm. clear, Catherine, unfortunately, we have to move on to yes. the next uh, person, uh, the next um, uh, uh, yes. um, the next segment of okay. uh, of the of the program. But we really appreciate you, Catherine, yes. for being here. We appreciate uh, Beatrice. We appreciate um, Habibo. Now, for the next session, we shall be inviting um, the statements from their excellencies, the, the chairs of the regional groups, and we will be asking them to come to the front. Um, so, Ambassador, His Excellency, Mr. Clever Gatete, uh, Ambassador of the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Rwanda to the United Nations. Um, Ambassador, His Excellency, Mr. Fatumanava O Opulu III Paolele Luteru, Ambassador of the Independent State of Samoa to the United Nations. Ambassador Mr. Ludbomir Danilov Frushkoski, Ambassador, Permanent Mission of the Republic of North Macedonia to the United Nations, who will be speaking for the Eastern European um, states. And uh, Ambassador Luteru will be speaking for the Asia Pacific states. And Ambassador Gatete will be speaking for the African states. Uh, please come to, to the front, please. And then we have uh, Ambassador Mr. Samuel Monkanda, uh, Ambassador for the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to the United Nations, who will be speaking for the Latin American and the Caribbean states. And then we have His Excellency uh, Ambassador Felgar Maithin, uh, Ambassador of the Permanent Mission of Ireland to the United Nations. Uh, who will be speaking for Western Europe and other states. So, Ambassador Maithen, um, from the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations, um, had requested to speak first. Yeah, he's coming. Oh, okay. Welcome, Ambassador. That's all. So, Excellency, Ambassador Maithen, uh, the Ambassador Permanent Mission of Ireland to the United Nations, will lead um, the session beginning with a statement representing the Western Europe and other states ambassadors from the whole of Western Europe and other states. And in this particular session, uh, we have it every year, where we hear the commitment uh, from the whole world um, in, as regards the prevention of, of genocide. Thank you, Ambassador. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for facilitating the early request. Today, I have the honour to deliver this statement on behalf of the Western European and others group. We meet today on one of the most important and indeed one of the most solemn days in the UN calendar. Together, we are marking 74 years since the establishment of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the landmark instrument by which the crime of genocide was codified for the first time under international law. It is a day for reflection 
and commemoration for all the victims who have suffered society's most heinous crime. It is also a day of action, a day for the international community to ensure that perpetrators are held accountable and for us to band together to ensure that genocide and mass atrocity crimes never happen again. We also have a responsibility, Madam Chair, to tackle the root causes and address the early warning signs associated with genocide and atrocity crimes. We have seen throughout history how hateful rhetoric can forge divisions that should not exist. Hate speech is designed to fuel animosity, resentment, and drive the agenda of those who seek division and violence over peace. When these narratives appear, the international community must react to refute and counteract them before disinformation can spread. But we must also redouble our efforts to prioritise prevention of these narratives in the first place. To this end, we must seek to promote social inclusion, cohesion and respect for diversity. Humanity is unquestionably diverse. This has always been something to celebrate. It is our strength, not our weakness. Unfortunately, there continues to be people who fear instead of cherish differences. Our first step must be to show otherwise. In the words of the late Nelson Mandela, no one is born hating another person because of the colour of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, then they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Madam Chair, for all our differences, for all our wonderful differences, humanity has always found a way to find common solidarity in a number of life's joys, whether that be music, art, literature, and of course, sport. We very much welcome the efforts of the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and the responsibility to protect to create a plan of action focused on sport to address and counter hate speech and we call on all relevant partners and stakeholders to become involved and to support these efforts. The key question for us is how can our reflection today lead us to better collaboration with our neighbours on this critical issue? Madam Chair, on this day we are reminded why the UN has come into being. From the darkness of its origins after the Second World War and the crimes of the Holocaust, Humanity put this convention into place in the pursuit of peace. It is our duty, it is our solemn duty, to uphold and advance its values. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, Ambassador Mr. Fegel, my then, uh, permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations. I, I would now like to call on uh, Ambassador Excellency Mr. Fatumanava O Upolu III Paulele Luteru, who is Ambassador of the Independent State of Samoa to the United Nations. Thank you, Excellency. Madam Chair, Excellencies and colleagues, on behalf of the members of the Asia Pacific Group, I am honored to deliver the following brief remarks on the 74th anniversary of the Genocide Convention and the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victim of the Crime of Genocide and of the Prevention of this Crime. We take this opportunity first and foremost to offer our deepest tribute to all the victims of genocide and reiterate our belief that genocide is a scourge on humanity and every effort must be taken to prevent such crimes from happening. We urge all member states to intensify and increase their efforts to prevent violent conflict and atrocity crimes, and in particular, the crime of genocide to hold those responsible to account and to continue to strive for peaceful resolution according to international law. We also take this opportunity to call on all those states that have not yet ratified or acceded to the Genocide Convention to consider doing so as a matter of priority. 
Today's anniversary highlights the many challenges faced by all those impacted by violence and war. We remain concerned that the perpetrators of many of the systemic violations of human rights and international humanitarian law, as well as acts that may constitute a crime of genocide, as per the 1948 Genocide Convention, continue to elude justice. We call on the international community to play a greater role in seeking justice for all victims of genocide. It is our collective responsibility to ensure accountability for all victims of genocide. We welcome the theme of this year's observance, the role of sports in atrocity prevention. We recognize that sports, arts, and physical activities have the power to change perception, prejudice, and behavior, as well as to inspire people, break down racial and political barriers, combat discrimination, and diffuse conflict, and thus help prevent atrocities. We believe that greater and sustainable investment in education and conflict resolution strategies will strengthen society's resilience to address the root causes of conflict, which can so easily lead to war and genocide if not adequately and effectively addressed. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Excellency Mr. Fatumanava or Pulu III, Paulelei Luteru, uh, Ambassador of the Independent State of Samoa to the United Nations for that statement delivered on behalf of the Asia Pacific States. I would now like to call upon His Excellency Mr. Luigi Bomil Danilov Rushkoski, Ambassador of the Permanent Mission of the Republic of North Macedonia to the United Nations, who will deliver a statement on behalf of the Eastern European States. Excellency. Thank you, Alice. Uh, on behalf of the EAG group of states, I will give a short statement concerning harm of the hate speech. Some values are so basic to any form of good life, or so central to the community moral identity, that no state can be remain neutral with respect to them. A state committed to the human dignity, gender and race equality, or a spirit of free inquiry cannot be neutral between the forms of speech or behavior that defend or discredit them. Hate speech strikes at the root of the shared communal life and represents a gross misuse of the right of a free speech. It expresses <clears throat> and promotes hostility to a group of persons, delegitimizes them, their membership of the political community, subjects them to the harassment and intimidation inhibits their participation in communal life and damages their sense of dignity and equal life chances. The right to free speech makes no sense outside a moral community. Although free speech is an important basic value, it is not only one. Human dignity, equality, freedom of life without harassment and intimidation, social harmony, national unity in a way, and protection of one's good name and honor are also central of the good life and deserves to be safeguarded. Since these values conflict, either inherently or in particular contexts, they need to be balanced. Hate speech is unaccept unacceptable for both intrinsic and instrumental reasons for what it is and what it does. Hate speech violates the dignity of the members of the target group by stigmatizing them, denying their capacity to live as responsible members of society, and reducing them to the uniform specimen of the relevant racial, ethnic, or religious group. Then, victims rightly conclude that the political community, without action, either shares that imply sentiments or does not consider that dignity, self-respect, and well-being important enough 
to warrant action. In either case, it forfeits its legitimacy and in their eyes, and can claim that neither to represent them nor to deserve their loyalty. Hate speech is unacceptable <clears throat> on a consequentialist grounds as well. It uh, encourages a climate in which over time some groups come to be demonized and their discriminatory treatment is accepted as normal. The violence that is implicit in a hate speech then comes to the fore. If anything can be said about a group of person with impunity, anything can also be done to it. Although law and international standards that we are speaking about has its obvious limits, they has an important role in discouraging hate speech. It affirms the community's commitment to certain basic values, lay down norms of decency, rational vulnerable groups helps create a climate of civility and prevents the normal intergroup conflicts and prejudice of multi-ethnical society from getting out of control. Law is most effective and in part wider, <coughs> in a wider discriminatory strategy accompanied by campaign, campaigning of public education, careful drafted and directed against clearly defined forms of hate speech. Now we speak in a, in a sport, of course. But the best strategy is, is that decisively in an early stage. Prescription of the, hate, uh, of the hate speech plays a particularly important role in preventing this kind of political mobilization of hostility against persons and groups. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. That was my statement. Thank you very much, Excellency. Mr. Lujbomir Danilov Shkorsky, Ambassador of the Permanent Mission of the Republic of uh, North Macedonia to the United Nations, and um, speaking for the Eastern European states. And I call upon um, the Ambassador Samuel, His Excellency Samuel Bonkanda, who is Ambassador for the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to the United Nations, um, who will be speaking for the Latin American and Caribbean states. If he is in the room, uh, to please come forward as he does so, we will now move to the permanent mission of the Republic of Rwanda, whose ambassador, Mr. Clever Gatete, is in the Security Council next door um, giving a briefing, and who is represented by the Deputy Permanent Representative Mr. Robert uh, Kayenamura, uh, Ambassador Robert Kayenamura, um, who will be speaking next. So, Excellency, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson. Indeed, as you said, my ambassador would have loved to be here, but he's uh, right across the Security Council delivering um, another statement. He hoped to be here right in time, but I think his statement uh, um, uh, is yet to be delivered in the council. Madam Chairperson, um, speaking on behalf of the African group, and we are pleased that we were invited to deliver a statement on this important day. Madam Chair, again, as those who spoke before me, today marks the 74th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which happens to be the first human rights treaty adopted by the General Assembly in the aftermath of the World War. This annual commemoration is an important opportunity for all of us to honor the victims of genocide. Genocide is an inhumane crime that affects every fabric of our societies. It is an assault on our most fundamental values. Today, as we remember and honor the victims of the crime of genocide, we must fight and find ways of preventing genocide at the core of our common values. Therefore, this treaty is imperative and remains relevant, particularly as we continue to work towards preventing genocide and its root causes. At the same time, we attempt to prevent other atrocities still being perpetrated with impunity 
with no regard to human life. And as we work to address the root causes of the crime, we should not forget the dangers of hate speech and discrimination, which are all warning signs of genocide. Madam Chairperson, again, this annual commemoration affords us an opportunity to reflect and to continue the fight against the genocide, genocide denial, its ideology, impunity, and ensure that we never again experience such heinous crimes against humanity. As a Rwandan in this regard, I would like to pay tribute to the victims of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi that happened in my country. We appreciate all efforts, supported, efforts from other countries that supported the Republic of Rwanda to move forward. We should therefore redouble our effort in fighting genocide ideology, its denial, as well as impunity. If genocide ideology persists, its denial will continue unabated and impunity will reign. This task should be the responsibility of both the governments and the people. It is the collective responsibility of the regional organizations and member states, civil society organizations, youth organizations, women's movement, media, and academic to fight this vice. We should correctively combat the genocide, impunity, hate speech, and the working towards resolving this issue once and for all. This commemoration should again remind us that past never be repeated. It should challenge us to deal with the present and the future in our efforts towards achieving peace for all of us. We must remain constantly vigilant of key political, human rights, humanitarian, social, and economic developments worldwide to identify early warning signals that contribute to atrocity crimes. Madam Chair, the African Union has tried its best. It has passed resolutions encouraging countries that have not done so to investigate, arrest, prosecute and extradite genocide fugitives currently residing in some countries. It's our hope that this call will be hindered too and bring the perpetrators to account for their crimes so that the crime is not repeated again. Madam Chairperson, allow me just in our national capacity to say a few words, I think, uh, in your office, at the Office of the uh, Prevention of Genocide. Sometimes we think that probably you swim alone because if your office is given only $2 million to deal with this problem, I think we're not going anywhere. And I'm happy that today you called on the regional groups to speak on this matter. When this issue now of hate, which is as complicated as it is, online and offline, complicated to fight, genocide denial, very complicated to fight alone, with the other member states, of course, I think we need to redouble the efforts to make sure that your office is well resourced. We cannot give a very strong mandate and then probably give you $2 million per year. I think the organization needs to rethink in a way I think two weeks, I mean, it was just last week or probably this week, you had launched a global appeal to support the mandate. And yet, actually, the organization that gives you the mandate, we should be giving the needed resources to handle this particular important task. So I think, and again, again I'm happy that the, the regional groups spoke today. I hope we'll pick it up to take it to another level whereby the mandate is given the needed resources and the expertise, both human and financial, to be able to take on the collective uh, voices you've had today. And I hope probably uh, going forward, we we'll, we'll look forward to you coming to, again, these regional groups to brief us on what is at stake, what needs to be done including on how we can mobilize the necessary resources for your office, including uh, giving it the necessary human resource 
that are needed. And again, giving it the resources to fund those particular programs that are geared towards prevention. So uh, uh, those were in my national capacity, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. And before we come to the end, um, much appreciation to all the Excellencies, Ambassadors who have spoken on behalf of the regional groups. We shall be following up uh, with the Latin American and, and Caribbean states for their statement and, and sharing it out to everyone. Um, and uh, I would like to acknowledge that uh, this game plan that's been launched today, the plan of action for countering um, hate speech through sport, um, is the second uh, plan of action that's been launched. The first one was a plan of action for religious leaders and actors mm. to prevent incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. And uh, in this room are two people from the working group of, of uh, that plan of action. And we call it the first plan of action because it began uh, in, uh, in Morocco. So I would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Iktidar Chima and uh, Mr. Pritpal Singh, and who actually flew across continents to come here for this meeting today. And to say that um, I truly appreciate, and um, Excellency from Rwanda, maybe you've touched a little bit on, uh, on the fact that this office has such few people, yet we really punch above our weight. We do so much. Uh, we, uh, on any given day, there's something going on uh, in our office. Um, we um, are very overworked, I can tell you. We are everywhere. Um, in the space of, for example, just this last month, uh, um, we've been to so many places. Like, we, we go because we have to respond to these situations of concern. And um, at the same time, beyond going to the ground, of course, we have to keep issuing statements. We have, because we are supposed to alert the world when these kind of things are happening. So huge amounts of analysis, huge amounts of work done by our office. And so therefore, I really appreciate our team uh, that's here. I see Sam here, Flavia, I see Maria, I see Rose Roll, um, then Simona is right here. Morenike is, is somewhere, I've seen her somewhere. So our team, and we are only 12 of us, and we do so, so much. So, you know, we've seen the power of sport being harnessed quite a bit to support agendas for peace and development. Quite a bit of that, uh, many launches happen around peace and development. But today, what we've done today is historical. We've written our way into the books of history because there has never been an action plan that looks specifically at sports as a tool to root out hate and to prevent atrocity crimes. This is the first one. So this game plan that we are launching today, focusing on sports leagues, sports teams, fans, and their roles in addressing and countering hate speech, which is then in line with the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech, is such a momentous, momentous thing that has happened today that it uh, could probably be beyond a description and one day somebody will remember that uh, this was the day that, that this happened. So, and just like to remind you that um, although we've made great significant progress in understanding all these risk factors that cause genocide, indicators and early warning signs, we really are far from a position where we can say that this horrific crime is relegated to the history books. Um, the ambassador from Rwanda has spoken about genocide denial. We speak about it often. Holocaust denial, genocide denial, their rise, their connection, the fact that neo-Nazi symbols, swastikas, um, can even become something that is worn without question and displayed without question, speaks a lot to what's happening to us as a world our moral values, what we stand for. And I can only say that uh, on the basis of my office and on the basis of the United Nations, the mandate that I have from the United Nations, that we shall not relent, that we shall keep speaking. We shall brief uh, the, the groups uh, of um, the ambassadors. We've done so on, uh, occasionally, but we'll brief them from a stronger perspective now that we have a game plan so thank you very much, everybody. 
A warm welcome to all of you who've come today for the first time to the United Nations. And we look forward to a future in which excellencies, we come to your countries with this game plan. And then we work with your sports teams, with your leagues, with your fans, so that we then get this message out. Because at the end of the day, prevention of atrocity crimes does not belong to an office. We push it out as much as possible. It must belong to the world. It must get into curriculums. It must get into all stages of socialization of children. And people need to get inspired to understand that never again was not a phrase that did not mean that it will happen again. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I really, really appreciate the fact that you came today. I appreciate all those who joined online. I appreciate all the excellencies who are sitting back there who've sat through all this. Thank you so, so much. And see you all soon, because we will be coming to you with a game plan. Thank you.